I'd like to introduce our, spe our second keynote speaker, Marita Walker. Uh, Marita is the branch manager of the Scheme Innovation in the National Disability Insurance Agency. Marita is part of a national team responsible for, for strategic advice, research and inclusion. Her work currently focuses on the WA individual living options to be effectively transitioned and the approach developed to be adopted nationally. This is looking at things a little bit differently. We've had some conversations with Marita before. Marita will focus on the NDIA's individual living options project project. She's not here as a representative for the National Disability Insurance Scheme for you to talk about the particular issues that you're experiencing. I know that it's tempting when somebody from the NDIA is here, but if you would like to speak to her afterwards, then you can by all means buttonhole her later. But when you come up with your questions, she's talking about the Individual Living Options Program today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am, I am quite familiar with talking to people around the country uh, about uh, the NDIS. So, um, uh, I'll stay up front that uh, things are not perfect and uh, I won't pretend that they are uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about uh, things generally. Uh, I have um, uh, come today to talk about the Individual Living Options uh, Project which I've been involved with for the last year or so. Uh, prior to that I was the uh, trial site manager and then the state manager in WA. So I, I'm based in Perth. Uh, the project that I'm now involved with is, is a national project and, uh, and therefore it's, it's entirely applicable uh, to people in uh, the ACT and, and across the country. And we've, we've talked already uh, and the Minister spoke about how important it is for us all in terms of where we live and choices around where it is, who it is with, and, and how we uh, have the support that we all need to, to have a home environment that gives us the sense of home and safety and security and, and relationship. And, and the, uh, the scheme is, is important in terms of furthering that being a reality for, for people with disability. It is our vision for participants to be able to do differently in the in uh, in the future and have more choice and control about their home, and and we've and and that involves the particular parts of the home that are about the we all need a, a bricks and mortar solution, and and then we all have uh, things that happen within our home for people with disability that often involves a level of of formal support to enable them to, to, to live a good life in the, in the bricks and mortar. So this project that I'm going to talk about has a focus on the supports in the home. And that acknowledges that we have to have uh, a home, a house in which for those supports to be provided. But the focus of the, 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 the work that I'm talking about today uh, relates to the support in the home. When we talk about uh, an individual living option, um, I'm conscious that uh, there's terminology that can lead to confusion. And, uh, and within the, the scheme, uh, we've, we've come up with, ra with terminology and, and acronyms that uh, lead, lead to different ways of describing things. So in the scheme, it, it has come to be just use the term supported independent living or SIL for short, which we actually mostly have as funding for people who live in group homes in the, in the, doc, in the research that Chris has described. Uh, and so uh, Chris has described something other than group home as supported living and, uh, and, and we can't do that within our scheme uh, nomenclature because that means something different. So, so I'm using the term individual living options. It's an overarching description of, uh, of, 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 of arrangements that have been individually designed around the needs of the individual and the support can take quite different forms to that which uh, is uh, an hour by hour rostered person support. So, so that's the sort of description that, uh, that we, and, and terminology that uh, I'm using in, in the terms of this project. 
And one of the reasons that I'm doing this project is that I come from, from Western Australia where over time uh, we've had a greater emphasis on developing uh, the sorts of options I'm describing, of having opportunities for people to have had individualised funding and for people to be able to choose to work with a provider to design a, a support arrangement, a living arrangement, with their individualised funding that, uh, that suits their uh, family member, suits the person, that person with those particular disability characteristics and for, for that to be uh, something that has, has become much more prevalent than I've come to understand is in many other uh, parts of Australia. So if I say that that's the, the, the nature of the project I'll, uh, and, the, and the definition of what we're talking about, I'll tell you a little bit about where we're, we're up to in, in the project and, and where, where things are heading. So if we talk about, for an individual living option, these are the things that are incredibly important uh, when you think about does it meet this criteria. It is starting off with a, a design of, of looking at the person's particular needs, their circumstances, what uh, their interests are, where, the com where their community is and where their links are, and, and how will that impact on, on designing a living arrangement for that person. And then you have a, a period of, uh, uh, within a package of supports, we're describing that there's a primary support and some supplementary supports that will make up a package for that individual. And so we call those supplementary supports. So the intention is that you are looking at uh, a, an a living arrangement that has been designed around that person. And then those arrangements are things that you put in place and you look at how well they're working and often they will need to be tweaked. Sometimes they'll, uh, at, when things change, they'll need to be really significantly redesigned and that's part of an individual living option experience. You, you are looking at it in the, in the way that um, Chris has described uh, active support, you are actively involved in seeing what's working in that situation and how can that uh, be improved on a day-to-day -day basis and how might it need to be redesigned uh, in a significant way. Uh, and and that's, that's a, a key component of what we're thinking about when we describe an individual living option. Now, we... This, this way, uh, you know, to talk about this slide, I'm, what I'm talking, going to describe are things that are possible and uh, are evident in, in the individual living options that, that are in place, not just here in Australia, not just in Western Australia, but internationally. And uh, are, are ways of thinking about the, how people live, who you live and how they're supported that uh, are real and are, are happening. These are descriptors. They're not sort of um, sort of looking. You you not a matter of looking at them. Say, oh well, I'll have one of those. They are things that might combine in different ways for different people, and uh, and there there may be other things that we could describe. But but when it's it's really helpful to talk about. Well, what does this? What might this actually look like? And so. So we've used these uh, descriptions. The first one I'll, I'll mention is called a host arrangement. There are other ways that it's described in different places, but the key part of it is to think about that it's a person with disability who lives in the home of someone else who is an unrelated uh, person for who, who is providing their home as, as a, a home for the person with disability and and they're engaging them in their family and community life. They uh, are likely to have some, some supplementary supports for, for the person who might live with a, another family for part of the time. 
uh, and the person will also have uh, community activities or work that they do, but their main living arrangement is in the home of someone who's providing them support um, in a, what we call a host arrangement. People with disability, uh, we, we all, we have all, um, a general community, you, you make choices about who you live with. And, and that should be the opportunity that people with disability also have. So we call living together, people who live together might in, a, in different sorts of relationships. It might be a relationship of being with a, a, a friend or a sibling, a life partner, it might be an intimate relationship, all the usual, uh, it might be more than, more than one friend. Many of us have had different times of our life. We have a, um, it's much more usual for people at, as, as they leave home to live in a shared house uh, and, uh, and then move on to living with a partner in a, in a longer term arrangement for people that changes, I mean, some people that changes a number of times over our lifespan. So living together is, is, what, is when we're describing this situation where the, where the other person is not part of the support arrangement for the person with disability. Using the term co-residency when you're talking about the person with disability is in a home that is their home and it doesn't, it's, it's not the, the matter of, it could be their own home in terms of ownership, they could be tenants, a whole range of tenancy arrangements, but the support that uh, the co-resident is is largely sharing that home in some way. It might be that they live in it in a very full-time arrangement. Uh, it may be that there are a couple of co-residents who stay a day, to a few days at a time, and or a week at a time. There's very significant ways in which this can can play out. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a short segment on the program called The Project that talked about uh, an arrangement where um, the, the, was a, the, it's a housemate, flatmate, and uh, li living with a person with disability. And that's, that, that can be called a, a home sharer, or a housemate, flatmate, and, and those arrangements are, 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 are very widespread uh, in the UK in particular. Um, and, and have a lot of potential to, to really uh, enable people to have a, 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 a very positive and inclusive life. So co-residency has got a lot of different variations. And, and living alone, um, it's people, for, it's, people choose that for a range of reasons and that happens for people with and without disability. And it's, it's then thinking about, well, how is that, uh, how can that be supported in ways that maximise the natural and community supports and informal supports that, that uh, you want, that people have in their lives. So when we talk about people living alone and, and talk about it within the context of individual living options, it isn't actually just people um, who, who will manage with uh, what can be termed drop-in support that's not 24 hours. So people in individual living arrangements can be supported in ways that uh, include 24 hour support. But we would not think about that in terms of being eight, three hour, three rosters of eight hours a day. That, that's more like a group home for one, if you've got three lots of people coming in. So in terms of, of how uh, we're thinking about this as, as a definition of something that uh, has its own um, way of being described and, and funded and support and, and delivered in, in real life, uh, where the, the majority of the situations that we would describe in this way, um, they have those elements I've talked about earlier of being primary and, and supplementary. You've, had a, you've got a package that looks personalised for the person, for the individual that you've, you've designed it for. It will generally be for people with moderate to, to, um, to high support needs. There are many people for who, who are well able to live uh, in the community, in their own home, whatever the, the, the housing has been supported, how, whatever the housing is organised, and for whom coming, having someone uh, come in on, on uh, scheduled drop-in visits, uh, and they're pretty 
they're fine to manage in between and are not getting uh, into strife, then those people would be more generally described as, as doing well with just some, um, some, some visiting supports. They're not necessarily looking at leading a whole package to, to, for their living arrangement. Up the, up the high end, uh, there is certainly the case that people with quite complex needs uh, can be supported in these sorts of arrangements. And often people uh, who in, the, in, what, in, w, in WA where we would describe that there's, uh, that we would estimate that there's between 600 and 1,000 people living in options that would meet this uh, criteria, people uh, are often have had an experience of, of being in a, a group home situation that, and it really hasn't worked for them. And so they've, they've been had the, the uh, opportunity and uh, with, with the same amount of funding, not with lots of extra funding, um, they've been able to design an option that is, involves them living alone, but, uh, but doing that um, in different ways. So, so that sort of just gives you a sense of, of the description and scope. And if I just uh, now talk briefly about where we're up to in, in the work of the project that, uh, that I'm leading. So uh, we did look uh, initially back in um, late last year around the um, looking at what, how we would describe these options, what they looked like, what was the scope. And uh, we had a sample, <coughs> excuse me, of options that were examined by the Office of the Scheme Actuary and, did, and, and they were able to, to determine that these were options that were uh, no more expensive than people who had similar characteristics and were living in group homes. And particularly for host arrangements, these, they were uh, options that were, were generally on average a, a bit lower, lower cost. But I don't want to sort of emphasise that, that cost is not the sort of driver of this. It's about individuals being, having the opportunity to have support designed around their needs. Uh, so what happened in April of this year is that we, we had agreement uh, that, that people who were in individual, something that would fit this description of an individual living option would have that option sustained in, this, in the scheme uh, rather than what was happening, and uh, this is something that I, uh, it has been a reality, and, and I know that there are uh, situations here in the ACT that uh, have have not had the the package nature of their supports recognised, and and they haven't been they haven't translated into an individual's plan in a way that sustained those arrangement of what we would call an individual living option. So we did gain um, uh, agreement through our policy committee that this is, these options would be maintained. And so that's, that's work that's going on now across, uh, across the country. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a, a relevant point stage at which to mention that uh, a discussion that I've, that I've had today here uh, it is that uh, there are examples of the, the LINK program that um, would fit into that criteria of individual living options that, uh, that we, can, we can move to recognise not only the individual parts of that but also the, the communities and coordination and supports and, and uh, characteristics of building informal supports uh, are recognised as, as a supplementary support within an individual living option. So, so, so those things, uh, there's people for whom host arrangements in um, both New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, South Australia are now being recognised and, and uh, brought into the scheme uh, in recognising that these are uh, people for whom those arrangements are, are working well and, and are funded within their plan. What's happening at the moment is that we're doing uh, more work that uh, need, needs to be done to enable uh, the policy framework and the practice about how we will do this to be happening across the country. And, and we're looking for that to be something that is uh, more widely available and for, as from sometime early next year. 
and so that, that we can have more sessions and more opportunity for uh, uh, the way this forum's um, been set up to enable people to be aware of different things that are possible and to enable the what we will call the exploration and design of those to be something that's recognised as, as important aspects of, of being funded within people's plan to enable these, these options that work for people you know, in a very tailored way and engage their informal supports and, and take account of their, their personal differences that that'll be something that will be more widely available across the country. That's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to, to, to take time, but it, uh, it's certainly a big step forward to, to be not having things disrupted that, that were really meeting that criteria. I just wanted to um, include these few principles because they're things that uh, you want, were absolutely fundamental when we're talking about the uh, uh, what it is that uh, you're focusing on um, when you're designing uh, arrangements for people. So it's about belonging, connection, and uh, we've talked about that uh, in terms of our, our sense of home, where, about people having relationship and having meaning and purpose, uh, and people being able to be supported to make decisions and have experiences so that they're making decisions about things that they, they've had a go at. About flexibility and being involved in, in who it is that you support, who, who it is that's providing the supports to you. And that's a really strong element of whenever we're talking about an individual living option, you're actually recruiting and looking for people to provide that support that you're uh, that the person at the centre of it is, is, has a say in who that is. And about being uh, an equal partner in the relationship about the design of, of, of your living arrangement. What it is, who, who you're sharing it with, if you're sharing it with anybody, and who are the people that are providing the support to you. And uh, just, uh, just get, give you the opportunity to share this very brief um, a uh, story about um, George, who is, has, um, was living in a group home for, for quite a number of years, and uh, that didn't go well for him. It, it resulted in a decline of his mental and physical wellness. And uh, his mother took action. Now, acknowledge uh, right up front that that's not the sort of thing that every family has the the um, financial capacity to do or uh, the, the considerable courage that would have been involved in doing it at that time. Um, but um, with, the, with the assistance of a, an organisation in Victoria called HomeShare, uh, that, um, that, that that's been a successful arrangement of, of, uh, for George having various people who are sharing his home uh, and on the basis of, of then having a subsidised rent and being someone that is not doing a lot of formal support but is providing uh, a home share is, is very much more about companionship and connection to community and uh, a, a buddy and, and the sort of normal things that a, a house sharing relationship would involve. So there's, there's a link there that uh, will be available when you, you receive the slides. And as I said, there was a, another great example of that on, on the project. And I should include that on the, on the information that, um, that I, I share with, with you for afterwards. Again, there's some resources there that, uh, that, give, that people can look at if this is something that you would li like to take um, further in, in your thinking. And, uh, and I know that there are organisations here in the ACT that are working with families to assist them to, to be thinking about these, uh, uh, these ways of, of uh, planning for the future for your family member. And uh, I was here a few weeks ago and, and spoke um, uh, with, um, with a smaller group, of, but people probably in very like, similar situations uh, with Imagine More. And, uh, and, and I know there's sort of a number of people who are on the, 
on the journey to be thinking about an individual living option as we've used that description for their family member. So if, if uh, I, I want to encourage you to, to, to be thinking about along those lines and, and feel encouraged that, uh, that the, the NDIS will facilitate and enable those things uh, in a more effective way in the future than it has done in the last few, couple of years. I'll pause there and see if there are some questions. Thank you very much, Marita. Um, folks, do we have any questions that are burning away for you for Marita? We've got a few here. We'll start over here with the tall gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi, it's David. Um, will the NDIA be actually training the planners and LACs to actually understand what's going on? Well, we have civil team that don't quite get across the whole planning process and I hope that is the um, LIOs actually get trained properly so they understand the process. Look, it's a, it, yes, I, I'll, uh, I'll, in, I'll take the inference that uh, there are aspects of, of uh, many things, not just uh, living arrangements, that um, uh, people have come, have, people have an experience that uh, the planners don't know about it. I'll accept that, and uh, yes, the reality is that when we um, need, when we roll this out as a as something that is uh, some a recognised opportunity uh, that we we fund and and we do that, we, it, it will come with internal guidance and will come with with awareness and and. Uh, um, planners knowing what it's about, so. That, that will be an, an important change management aspect of it, you're right. Now somebody over here. The lady with the white hair. Hi Marie, my name's Christine. Um, I think the burning question in the room may well be when do you anticipate we will see that magic situation where the planners are on board and we are able to have a planning meeting and say we want to explore an individual living option um, at a plan review meeting in the ACT. Look, the national rollout is, is scheduled for next year and the, uh, the, that's the, the, the opportunity to say that you want to explore something will be a, a key element of, of what, it, what it is will, you'll be able to, to say is something you include in your plan. So I can't give you a date. But I am more confident um, being able to say that uh, that if it's a recognised item that people have guidance about, it will increase the opportunity for it to be included in your plan. Uh, hello, I'm Mark Oshwar from Focus ACT here in Canberra. But my question is, that, and I think the NDIS is an amazing thing considering where we were 10 years ago. You know, there is it's brought lots of lots more good than it has bad across the board. Um, one of my questions is, and, and I'm really keen for it to be explored and people to be successful in getting alternative living arrangements. My concern is it's always great at the front end. My experience with the NDIS, it's great at the front end and then we get a year or two down the track and then we have a um, situation which we have now is that the inconsistency in planners' approach to reviews where all of a sudden planners are making decisions to remove whole community access support hours and so when you only have, and we only have around two to three people living together in our, with, that we support in our organisation, um, once you start stripping that back, people can't leave the house. How will you, how will you make sure that that's not going to happen to people, for example, if, if um, the young lady's brother was to end up in this situation and, this, and he's um, going really well and stable and then the planner decides, oh, well, we're having a de-escalation in, um, in incidences, we can remove the support now and, and they should be right again. But we know the reason why it's been successful is because of the support in place. How will we safeguard against this in the future? Because it's, it's getting out of hand at the moment. If you speak to a number of providers, planners are making huge decisions about people's lives that they don't even know um, that are having a, a very much a negative impact on those people's lives in terms of accessing the community. And um, when you question them on it, um, they, the excuse is, oh, we just have our template to throw the figures through and you think, oh, yeah, right. 
Okay, interesting. Sorry to be cynical there. I think it's we're going in the right direction, but we've got some significant bits to fix and, and reassure people of before they get out there on their own. Well, I, th I think that I can't answer your question in terms of the circumstances that you described, because I can't... Um, I don't have enough information and I'm not involved in the decision making at reviews. So um, I, I can accept that you have uh, that you have some issues, but I, I, I don't can't really answer your question in terms of. Uh, so one thing, perhaps, if I say that uh, when we talk about a package for people in the individual living options that we're talking about. For people for whom the evidence is clear that they need 24 hours of uh, monitoring stroke supervision and act to be to be safe, then the living arrangement is their living arrangement, and their community engagement is the other hours. So that's very clear. They're funded separately. Ex um, because that we want the opportunity for people to to choose that they have uh, different people for whom they do things within the community. That's that's a preference, and we want people to make sure they have that option. Their living arrangement is is uh, focused on their living arrangement, and the two go together. So uh, that that's that's uh, part of how these arrangements are currently being viewed. Um, and, and that would be the intent for the future. And Jenny, and I think we have one other question with this gentleman there. Thank you. Um, my question was more of a safeguards one as well. I am very excited, I'd like to see these different ideas and the co-residency co and living alone options in particular could work really well um, for my son. I've often dreamt about those sorts of um, options or just sharing with somebody like your case study there. But the one worry that keeps coming to my mind is what if they take advantage of him? And what if there's you know, a provider that comes around to give support and he wants to change and I'm no longer there to help him and he, you know, like I'm his only family really. So you know, if I'm there, not there to help him, what happens to him? Like, is there safeguards going to be built in so that those who cho choose these more isolated options for good reason and that, and as as he would, and it would suit him really well. But if there's safeguards, like somebody calling him at least once a week or dropping in to see him, that's not his regular. I don't know. I'm just thinking, can it be built into the process? So, so safeguards are really important, and they. The most, this, this is, I can quote the evidence on this because it's really clear, the very best safeguards are people having multiple relationships and multiple and many people that are part of their life and are eyes out for them. That is, and, and the, the whole point of an individual arrangement is that you, make, that you increase those number of people in someone's life. And so that the, the, there's more people that they can speak to raising a concern and for that to be uh, and, and when you're focused on on an in an individual situation that's what the person's there for you re recruited them for that purpose and and to increase the number of people around them so that is going to be the most effective safeguard and it's why uh, historically people for whom um, they're in in isolated um, group homes or institutional systems where they, they were very unlikely to have had multiple people around them, that, that the evidence is that that's, that is uh, a more likely situation in which neglect and abuse occurs. The other aspect of uh, individual living options is about that is, it is the role of the provider to be uh, safe, to, to be having safeguarding systems. So, so not, not, no one thing is a, is a, is a no one thing is a safeguard. A safeguard is multiple levels of uh, eyes and opportunities and um, the these as you say, sort of um, people to, to to 
have have a view, an, uh, an eye on the situation, and then when there is a you know if there's a formal complaint, there's a, a, a pl place to take that to, and um, you know we we so ACT is one of the early jurisdictions to become under the the banner of the National Quality and Safeguards Commission. That is the systemic place. It's not you know it's, it's not the the safeguarding place. It's 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 a, it's one part of the safeguarding system. So so. I think your question is very important, and and it's and it's how you design the safeguards in. You see, you ask those questions right at the beginning. So when we talk about when I get an, um, information that I look at, one of the the pieces of information is what risks have been identified, how are those risks been um, mitigated? So you see, it's it's part of the design, part of what you think of, and then it has to be part of what you apply once it's implemented. Thanks, Marita. I think we have just one last question. We are running a little over time, folks. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's uh, <clears throat> very useful to hear these perspectives. I'm actually going to uh, ask you a question about your talk uh, specifically. My background is both as an academic and a senior public servant and as a parent of uh, children with disabilities. I was interested in the way that you categorised the living options available to people with disabilities. Uh, and I'll preface this by saying, from my background, I know that the uh, system not working well after a period of time is not unique to the NDIA. Uh, many other organisations put very good plans in place and over time they, they deteriorate. Uh, my question is, when you are doing your planning and monitoring of the launch of your program around Australia, what do you have in place, and it's kind of a, uh, a conflation of a number of things that have been raised in the questions, what do you have in place to ensure that over time your proposals don't actually narrow options and provide public servants who are making these decisions with a menu from which they choose and if you don't fit the menu, you don't get the product? So. I think the really the, the focus is it's a, that we have uh, the criteria on which it's judged is has this has this been designed around the individual, and then it's and that then you've you have a, a support quantum that is not about but not about menu items. So so that so so part of the question is. The design of that from the beginning. So, I was careful to say to say those descriptions are just descriptions. They're not boxes that that you, you then tick and say I'll have one of those. So, so so the the key way to sort of mitigate the risk you're raising is and and we have thought about this. So is is to not is to not say not to just not to end up saying. Uh, individual living options can be this list of things. You know, we've made the menu mistake already, <laughs> and we're we're working hard to undo our major menu mistake, which is called the support catalogue. So, so we 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 know that mistake, and uh, and we're addressing it. In another year, you might have another forum and hear about that. Um, but but that's the focus for this is it's 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 not saying you can have one of this that looks like that but saying if you design around the individual and have a whole range of possibilities for that person they'll they'll get what the the package of things that work for them so you know sort of you would know that I can't offer the guarantee that you would would be looking for, but but at least I can say that I, we we've recognised the the risk and uh, it's one where it's a, a, a mistake already made and and so we we recognise that can't, uh, uh, hopefully we've learned about not making it again. Thank you very much, Marita. Put your hands together, please. Thank you, Marita for the time.